We were just having a conversation before we hit the record button. And Tammy, you were sharing a story with me about grief that might help people understand what we're going to talk about today. Can you share that with us? Absolutely. Well, it, it's an example of one of the six myths that keep us stuck in our grief because we hear it all the time. Time heals all wounds. You know, we wait for time to allow us to feel better. And while the intensity may lessen over time, the actual unresolved emotions don't go anywhere. And I believe the analogy you're referring to is if you had a flat tire on your car, you wouldn't get out your camping chair, your lawn chair, you know, sit down at the side of the road and wait for the problem to solve itself, for the tire to reinflate. You would call a friend, you would call CAA, you would fix the tire yourself. And that's what grief is all about. We we may not be responsible for the cause of the grief. We may not be responsible for what has happened to us, but we are responsible for taking the correct action steps to resolve those emotions and release them. As far as you say, correct answer actions that's is that going to differ for everybody as far as what that is well that's a great question amanda because one of the things that another thing that keeps us stuck in our grief is all the misinformation surrounding this and one of the biggest pieces of misinformation are the five stages of grief so elizabeth kupler ross created the five stages the first is denial and you work your way through the five till you get to acceptance but the interesting point is, and Elizabeth Kupler-Ross says this herself, those are the stages designed to support a dying person who has just received a prognosis. <laughs> it's 100% for the person who is dying. But for some reason, all of Western culture has embraced the five stages of job loss. So when I refer to the correct steps, um, I'm referring to the steps that a griever can take that are proven to get them to the other side of this emotional pain. But we are so using the wrong tools to be able to process this grief. It's like we're trying to paint a room with a screwdriver mm. and we just keep spinning our wheels. Amazing. That doesn't sound good. <laughs> what happens if we continue to ignore it? Good question. So you guys have great questions. Well, what happens is grief is cumulative and it gets stored in the cells of our bodies. And so we get those gentle nudges, you know, at the beginning, you know, maybe we're having trouble sleeping, maybe our eating patterns change, you know, there might be some feelings of depression or anxiety or whatever, but your body just keeps turning up the volume and turning up the volume, trying mm -hmm. to get your attention. And eventually, I'm not saying it will but it can manifest in the physical form because it just keeps building. It does not go anywhere. And grief is a normal and natural process. Grieving is a natural step to mending our broken heart. But what we've been taught in our culture is to bury that grief. And so instead of using our bodies like a processing plant, we're using it as a storage facility. And like any piece of equipment, when it's not used properly, eventually it breaks down. Go ahead. You've got something. Yeah, something. Is grief always sad? Like, how does grief show up for people? It's not always sad. And that is also a good question. You know, we can have several losses that make us feel uncomfortable, make, make us feel sad or whatever. But we move forward from that it's the stuff that loops and loops and loops and loops and here's the other thing it doesn't always have to be sad so there's over 40 reasons why we grieve yes some of them are sad like the loss of a loved one a, a romantic breakup a financial situation that sort of thing but it can also be happy things like having a baby graduating getting a promotion so I think as a follow-up to that question, let's go back a little bit and revisit what is the definition of grief. Yes, please. Okay, so what I'd like the listeners to do is just filter your life through these five statements. 
Grief is an emotional loss of any kind. It's a change in something that was familiar. It's the things that we wished had been better, different, or more. It's about our unrealized hopes, dreams, and expectations. And it's about the things that have been left unsaid. So you can see now, perhaps, you know, a happy occasion. If you look at having a baby, your whole life changes and it changes forever. You know, once you were single and free and whatever, and now you're responsible for this new baby, plus the hormones and all that stuff. So, yes, it's it's a happy occasion. But sometimes we have to grieve the lot the life we lost. That's so that's so interesting. I've never heard someone say something like that to think that like when you said it could be a new job it could be a baby and it's i get it and the connection you made there we're grieving the life we lost right even for someone who's gone through an extreme weight loss or who's made like Mm -hmm. i can look at the health changes that i've made for myself and friends change when you start to make changes for yourself and it's wow there's grief around that right like it's big good big things happening to you and for you Mm-hmm. but life changes very absolutely interesting. yeah so and even with a promotion like say your promotion includes a move maybe mm-hmm. a change in your financial status you know you're losing your team you're moving to another city whatever mm-hmm. these can all be really great things and yes you want the promotion but to really step into it really enjoy it and embrace it if it starts looping you've got your signal that it's time to process those emotions. And when you say looping, what exactly is that process for someone or can be that process? You just keep thinking about the same thing over and over and over. You go out in a social event, you're sharing the same story over and over and over. You get up in the morning, you're thinking about it. You go to bed at night, you're thinking about it. And the irony of the whole situation is our bodies are programmed to do two things. So one is it wants to complete the experience. Mm -hmm. It's normal and natural to resolve these emotions. But the other part is if we don't like the ending, what we try to do is rewrite the story that's already taken place. That doesn't stop us from revisiting and revisiting. What does is resolving those emotions and allowing our bodies to Mm -hmm. just release them. How can a person know if they have unresolved emotions around grief? Well, it's the looping. It's all of those things, um, you know, the the changes that you experience, like not being able to focus, brain fog, um, broken relationship after broken relationship. Um, There's something to be said for emotional baggage. Because let's say in your previous uh, relationship, you were betrayed or your partner cheated on you or whatever, your new uh, relationship does not stand a chance if Mm -hmm. you're still filtering it through that betrayal or that loss of trust. So what you want to do is kind of wrap everything up with that previous relationship before you step into this new one so that you're right there in the present moment. You know, um, you two are probably both really familiar with this, but, you know, your conscious mind plays such a small role. Your subconscious mind is, you know, driving the ship, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But because it's so busy and it has so many things to do, as soon as a similar experience comes up, it just opens the file and it goes on to do something else. So if we're not consciously aware of what we're thinking and what we're feeling and experiencing, we're really just in a memory. You know, we're not present and in in that particular situation, current situation. Hmm. And how is that impacting or how have you seen that impact people's other areas of their lives? How does that like ripple out into everything else? Oh, it affects your self-esteem. It affects your confidence. So You know, when you resolve these emotions, you're a different partner, you're a different boss, you're a different coworker, you're a different friend. So let me use myself as an example. So I had tons of unresolved emotion, but because I was doing what everybody else does and I was processing it, I thought intellectually, 
-hmm. I had convinced myself that, you know, I was okay. And for me, what it showed up as was I was locked in to a constant state of fight and flight because my self-confidence had been shot. My self-image had been shot, like all of these different experiences. It just kind of chipped away at who I really was. So I was constantly living in fear and fear of everything. Mm -hmm. How I have any adrenals left, left is, I don't even know. I have no idea. But when I found grief recovery, I was in my late 50s. Mm -hmm. And I, I rolled up my sleeves when I realized I could really process these emotions and let them go. Rolled up my sleeves. I did the work and I didn't stop till I was done. But when I was done, I was no longer in that fight and flight. I had found this place of inner peace that today I will defend at all costs because I never thought I'd be here. And shortly after I finished the program, I actually went to a natural path and they wanted to test my adrenals. And I was, I was terrified because I had taxed them for most of my life. Mm -hmm. And when they checked my adrenals, they were at a hundred percent. Wow. Fantastic. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty cool. I believe in this process so much because I'm living proof that no matter what has happened in your past, you can move forward from that and you can release it, let it go. And your body starts to recalibrate, right? It starts to fall it back into that natural rhythm. Amazing. But Why are people hesitant to do the inner work to heal these uh, things? Yeah. <laughs> Same question. Uh, Yes, there's a lot of answers to that question. The biggest one that usually comes up when I talk to new clients is nothing else has worked. Mm -hmm. So we reach this point where, you know, we throw our hands up in the <clears> air and we go, well, why should I? Nothing else has worked. Another part of that, and you'll both be familiar with this, but, you know, we're taught, we're conditioned to put ourselves at the bottom of the list. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we don't give ourselves permission to take the time. We don't give ourselves permission to do the work. But more importantly, we don't give ourselves permission to do that financial investment. And, you know, when I first started doing this work, insurance doesn't cover my services. They're a fee for service. And, you know, I really bought into that frustration that um, the insurance company wouldn't cover cover my services and I knew they worked and I knew they were evidence-based and I was, you know, I was just so frustrated. But fast forward after doing this so many years, it suddenly hit me, wait a minute, people respond differently to a program when they invest on their own, number one. And number two, when I did this program myself to do my own inner healing, I paid for that, no, no one else did. And so I made this mindset shift, which was really important as an entrepreneur and really as important as somebody who's supporting others. I'm not asking anyone to do anything that I haven't asked of myself already. So I think it's it's that permission. I think it's we don't see value in it. And more importantly, well, nobody else has been able to help me. So I don't think you can either. Perfect. Uh, you mentioned earlier one of the myths of, I guess it's a myth of grief, is it? Yes. Time heals all wounds. What are the other ones that you, you have? Yes. So there's six of them, and they are so familiar to all of us. We all just reach out for them whenever we experience a loss. So the first one is we don't feel that we have a right to share our emotions. You know, we, we try to suppress them, we try to hide them. And the more we do that, the second myth is we isolate. We lock ourselves away from the people who maybe could support us. Mm -hmm. We try to be strong for someone else. And that's the biggest myth of all, because we can't do anything for anyone else. And by suppressing our emotions and our experience by trying to not make someone else feel uncomfortable not only are we denying ourselves the ability to heal but we're preventing that other person from sharing openly and honestly mm -hmm. um, the fourth one is we stay busy and we can talk about how do we stay busy if you want to 
um, we stay busy and we distract ourselves from those things that we don't want to know. At a very early age, we're taught to replace the loss. So most of us, our first experience with death is the death of an animal companion, a pet. And our well-intended parents will say, you know, don't feel bad. We'll get you another dog. And then the final one is time heals all wounds. And the more we wait for time to help us feel better, the longer we delay actually taking steps because we start to really think there's something wrong with us instead of questioning the tools that we've been asked to use all this time. So interesting. Okay. So when people are going through a grief, if they haven't met someone like you, if they haven't met a grief recovery coach, is that what you can call yourself? A grief recovery specialist. Specialist. If they haven't met a grief recovery specialist, why do other methods are, why are they not helpful? There's two reasons. Um, one is nine times out of 10, they're using the five stages of grief model, which mm -hmm. is designed for the dying, not the living. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I just, blanked out on what the other one was um oh we intellectualize our grief we think we can problem solve our way through this you know we try to analyze it we try to understand it we mm -hmm. we really stay up here in our head mm -hmm. but grief is a hundred percent emotional and the other thing is it's a hundred percent based on your relationship with that person or that event so say there's a family of five, say the mother has died. Well, the husband and the three remaining children will all grieve the mother's death completely differently based on the relationship that they had. And because everybody's grieving differently and probably still intellectualizing at this point, there are so many family dynamics that come up because, well, you don't care because you're not, right? because everybody's dealing with it differently. Um, grief is always healed from the heart. It's never healed from the head because it's not your head that's broken. <laughs> so did that answer your question? Yeah, that was great. Um, do you have something? It's a good reminder, actually. You're mentioning that we're all up in our heads about how to handle things when it's all here <laughs> that we need to be focused on. And we're a lot of the time is very disconnected from this part of ourselves to, I guess, keep going. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I say to people, you know, um, going through grief recovery is very much like, remember back when we were in elementary school and there was a sentence and you had to put the noun and the verb and the adjective on the blank in the sentence. It's kind of that way with grief recovery. It's we don't need to figure out who's right or wrong. We don't need to analyze it. We don't need to judge it. We don't need to criticize it. It's simply, here's what happened. Here's how I felt. Here's mm -hmm. how I complete that emotion. And your body, your heart, because it's a normal and natural process, it recognizes it. And honestly, it just goes. Mm -hmm. It's really that simple. And the hardest part for me is, um, being patient long enough for people to realize it is that simple. It's not complicated at all. When you have the right steps, it is just so easy. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's John shares this story about he had friends and they had a three-year-old and his hamster died. And so they called John and they said, you know, we really want to make sure we do this right. And he said, he's three, right? They went, yeah, and he said, he'll be fine. Because up until the age of three, we know what to do. Hmm. So he said, I want you to watch him. If you have any concerns, give me a call. But he said, I'm telling you right now, he's going to be fine. And he said, the only advice I'm going to give you is do not buy him a new hamster unless he asks for one. So the little boy went up to the hamster cage with the dead hamster in the cage and on a three-year-old level did the grief recovery method process. Perfect. Mm -hmm. They took the hamster out, buried him in the garden. And it's been a long time since I've heard the story. I, I can't remember. Three months went by, six months went by, like quite a bit of time went by. 
And the little boy asked his mom if he could get another hamster. Well, because he had completed these emotions in a normal and natural way, he took the new hamster out to the garden, introduced him to the old hamster. He was very clear in his mind, even at three, this was a new relationship, not a replacement, and it would be a different kind of relationship. And in three-year-old language, you know, he said to the, you know, dead hamster, um, thank you for being my friend. I hope the new hamster will be my friend too. Mm -hmm. But no comparison, no replacement. He knew exactly how to grieve the loss. Yeah. So the that's the sad part for me, right? Yeah. The intelligence yeah. of young people, really young people, just to know intuitively. And they are more intuitive because we've lost that in some ways, some of us, just to know what to do. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. They don't get stuck in the judgment that yeah, we get stuck talking. in too, right? Of <laughs> self and others and yeah. so many, they still are wide open to that. And so that's and it's amazing. Interesting. Yeah. And it's interesting. I've worked with a lot of like young adults. So, you know, not like me when I was in my fifties, but you know, they're still starting their journey mm -hmm. and they move through this process so fast, so fast because they don't have all of the baggage that we mm -hmm. have. But the best part is, you know, say at 21, 22, they have a tool for the rest of their lives to be able to process loss. And I think that's the thing for me, another message that, you know, especially people who are listening who've done the grief recovery method, you know, yes, you cleared the deck. You, I, I liken it to when you come to me, you've got a table full of dirty dishes. What we want to do is clear away the dishes and put down a, a fresh tablecloth. But life isn't static. Yes, you did a great job, but life happens and new stuff will happen. So instead of starting to store all that stuff again, mm -hmm. you know what to do. And I was introduced to this method in 2016, and I still regularly do the process if I start looping because I, like I say, I'm going to protect that piece I found at all costs. And um, so I think that's the thing. It's not a one-shot deal, but it is a one-shot deal in the fact that if you just listen, pay attention, and you just clear the deck when you need to, you stay in this place of presence. Yeah, it's pretty cool. That's amazing. I was going to say, because when you were saying that, I was going to say it's not one and done. It's like you don't go for a massage treatment and think like, okay, I'm good. I never need to go to the massage therapist again. It's like we're going to constantly experience different things. And now you have a tool to be able to help yourself handle them better. So I think that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how you started actually with talking about listening to the body. That's something we say a lot as well and paying attention and actually reconnecting to your body and being aware of what those messages are, are like, crucial to be able to use the tools you have. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree with that so much. And as I've gone on this journey, you know, like we all started at a different point and we access different people along the way, but I have come now to so be able to trust what my body is saying, to be able to kind of zone in on what it is that needs my attention and then, you know, over the years have built this kind of roster of people. Oh, okay. I need to see this. Or, oh, I need to mm -hmm. see this person or whatever. Right. Perfect. And um, I think that's a real gift to be able to get to that point, you know? And I remember I used to belong to a networking group and people are, knew me and, you know, we had a chance at the beginning to say what we do. And I remember driving to Burlington that day going, oh, what am I going to say? Like, I've said this so many ways. What am I going to say? And then all of a sudden, it just hit me. So for those people who are on a spiritual journey, what grief recovery does is it teaches you how to be human. Hmm. We're here, you know, if you believe this, we're spiritual beings having a human experience. This is our vehicle. This is how we experience this lifetime. And emotions can impact us on so many levels, so many levels. And so by learning how to process and resolve these unresolved emotions, 
what we do is we put more gas in our tank and we don't allow this body to start breaking down because we've turned it into a storage facility, right? And so part of grief recovery is learning the tools on how to be human, how to take care of this vehicle. So interesting. I heard it. You're hitting so many things in this conversation that I'm like, yes, yes. But I heard it explained as like, we're two things when we come here, human and being. And it's about how to get them to work well together and communicate with each other. Like all of the doubts, all of the limitations, all of the thoughts where I'm not good enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not strong enough, whatever it is, that's the human side of it. The being side of it is limitless. And how do and we get those to like interconnect and, and work together in the best way possible? Absolutely. And it's, it's being able to reach that point. I just did a whole series on, um, on Facebook about raising your vibration, because I believe right now, collectively, we're going on this consciousness shift, this journey of evolution. Mm -hmm. Well, low vibrational frequencies will not exist there. And if we're still carrying them, we can't move to that next kind of vibrational frequency. And grief and apathy and regret, you know, they are such a low vibrational frequency. And so one of the things in the series that I was talking about, like really one of the first steps is kick those low vibrational frequencies to the curb because automatically you all of a sudden rise so much quicker, right? And the more of us that raise that vibrational frequency, the faster we can move through this. And I think it's going to be so worth it when we get to the other side of whatever it is, <laughs> whatever it is we're in. I think it's going to be really cool and it's going to be worth the work that we've done to get there. Amazing. If you have a link for that, we'll share it in the show notes so people can check it out. Great. As well. Amazing. Okay. Hmm. Are there simple steps that you can offer the listeners to how they can move forward or ways they can improve how they're dealing with things currently? Yeah. And just before I answer that question, um, what I want to do is just kind of highlight what the people do to stay busy because it ties into the oh, answer. To yeah. that question. So, you know, because we're taught not to look at this stuff because we push it away and we don't want to be involved in it. Mm -hmm. We do things that the Grief Recovery um, Institute calls STIRBS short-term energy relieving behaviors hmm. and when you first experience a loss yeah it's normal and natural and there's nothing wrong with doing it and so you know you might have another glass of wine you know you might have a few more french fries a bag of chips you might stay at work a little longer maybe hang out at the gym a little bit more binge watch netflix you know for a couple weeks normal or natural but what happens is, because we're trying not to think about these things, the stirbs step up and they step into that driver's seat, mm -hmm. trying desperately to distract us so we don't want to think about the things that we don't want to think about. So in answer to your question, Amanda, the first thing I would say is, what are you doing more of? that you didn't used to do, like, what is it mm -hmm. that maybe you just don't want to think about? And then the next thing, um, kind of what you said, Amanda, and the fact, like, feel it in your body. Where are you feeling it? So this is all that awareness piece, because we can't make any change if we're not aware, right? Um, becoming aware that we're distracting ourselves, becoming aware that perhaps uh, we do have these unresolved emotions. So that would be step one. Step two would be taking responsibility. Remember how I said earlier, we may not be responsible for the pain, but we are responsible for the healing because it's mm -hmm. our body that's being affected. And one of the hardest lessons I think to learn through grief recovery is that act of forgiveness. Because in our society, we've been taught well, it was no big deal, or I'm letting them off the hook, or I'm not getting my vengeance kind of thing. Yeah. Well, that person, they just don't care. And they're not aware of how you're suffering. And so that act of forgiveness is 100% about, you know, us. It's about 
freeing ourselves from that experience. And when we do, that's the best payback. That's the best revenge, you know, that we can offer. So then after you've become aware and you've agreed or been willing to take the responsibility, well, then one of the steps that I suggest is journaling. Because journaling kind of allows you to get it out on paper, Mm -hmm. maybe talking to a trusted friend, somebody who's just going to listen, not try to fix it, (laughs) not try to give a solution, but just listen. But eventually, usually what happens is grief is so personal and it's so deep. It's very hard to become the observer in our own lives. And so then I would suggest that you reach out for someone who can professionally kind of step into that observer's role, that supportive role, and help you navigate all the wounds that you're carrying that you really want to let go of. I love that advice because if they're reaching out to someone like yourself, you're unbiased. You're not, you're there for them, the, your client specifically, and to help them. You're, other people may have their own stuff they're bringing to the table when it comes to loss and grief. So it's, it's a really important thing you just said. And, you know, there's something else that ties into that too, Amanda, and as a practitioner, and I know the two of you, um, I've watched you do your own work, so I'm sure you'll be on page with this, but um, Socrates believed that the healer needed to remain um, harmed in order to be able to best help their patient. But I think today, the best practitioner, the best coach, the best support is someone who has already done the work themselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a practitioner myself, I really advocate for the person who's stepping into that supportive role to have invested in themselves first, which I know the two of you have done, to do their own work first, because I've done that. And I know that when someone has asked me for support, I'm 100% present for them, 100%, because I'm not trying to heal myself Mm -hmm. by healing them, which is impossible to do. And I think the hardest part for me after I'd finished all the work was um, I'm an empath, and all of a sudden, I couldn't feel the same way I used to. And it really scared me because Mm -hmm. I used to feel on such an intense level. And I remember calling a friend of mine, a colleague, and saying, you know, I think my heart's broken. Mm -hmm. And she said, what do you mean? What happened? And I said, I I think I took this grief recovery stuff too far. And she said, I don't understand. And I said, I can't feel the same way I used to. And she said, oh, darling, your heart's not broken. She said, it just burst wide open Mm -hmm. because you've learned that you don't have to get in the mud with them. You can stand on the shore with your hand out and you can offer them that support. And I think that was another lesson I learned as I did grief recovery. Because I was carrying so many unresolved emotions, because I was empathic and because I so wanted to help people, I had to learn that helping others when they haven't asked for help or Mm -hmm. owning their healing, which isn't mine to do, is actually a trauma response. Hmm. It's an unhealed trauma response. And so, you know, having gone through what I just explained showed me that I'd healed the trauma. Yes, I was still empathic. Yes, I still want to be in service. But I think the biggest thing is I only help people now who ask me for help. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I'm compassionate, but I don't kind of step in there to that, that role of, support when they haven't asked for it and again I can be so present without having to step into their story in order to support them I don't know does that make sense yes absolutely yep that's amazing it's not useful when it's your decision that this person needs help and I'm going to show up and help them it's like if they're not looking for that it's it's not helping right Amazing. Amazing. It's a hard, hard lesson to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. My brother and I both raised in the same family, but we both responded differently. And so I developed that whole savior complex where I wanted to save the world. And my brother built a brick wall 
around his heart that no one was going to penetrate. So again, it's that emotional experience based on your relationship with that person Mm -hmm. and those survival techniques that you reach for in order to survive. And I think that's another loss, um, uh, Kate, that, you know, we were talking about earlier. You've got to let go of the survivor you to become the healed you. And that's a grieving experience too. And so, you know, it's certainly not a prerequisite in the program, but one of the guidelines that we use is you never complete the relationship with yourself Mm -hmm. until you've done the other relationships first, because you are, you're able to sort out what's mine, what's theirs. And by the time you get to yourself, you're a hundred percent speaking to yourself and what's left to tie up any loose loose ends. Amazing. How much of this comes from our childhood and the way we're raised as well? Like I know that I grew up in a family. My dad left when I was four and it was this like, you need to be valuable or you need to be doing things for other people if you want to make sure that they keep you around. So like how much of this comes from people's childhoods and the way they're brought up? So much, absolutely so much. Like people will come to me with an immediate loss Mm -hmm. that of course is heartbreaking and something that we need to process. But part of the program allows you to kind of step back and get that aerial view of all of your life. Mm -hmm. And people are shocked at how far back this goes. Like it really, really does go back. And the other thing, there's two other things that, um, I've kind of learned as I've done this. Number one, I thought those limiting beliefs were mine, which we all do, right? Oh, I'm the only one that feels this. Mm -hmm. But I'm finding we all share the exact same belief system. So now it's like, hey, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. How does everyone I talk to have the exact same belief system? And of course, it comes from what we see and what we hear and what we experience. But the other thing, the more I do this work, I think a lot of what gets us in that, in the weeds to start with are expectations. Mm -hmm. So expectations we have of someone else who didn't meet them, let us down, disappointed us. But Mm -hmm. then the flip side, all those times we let ourselves down, those expectations we had of ourselves. And so without resolving those beliefs and those emotions, Well, they start looping and they start supporting the next story and the next story and the next story. So it becomes so, so very important. And that's why I say if I bring it back to the dirty table full of dishes, you don't want to just clear a couple of those dishes and put the tablecloth down because you know what that looks like, right? It's just bumpy and it's just a mess and nobody else. But the cool thing is, if you really invest and you clear the table and you put down that new tablecloth, well, what grief recovery does is brings you back to this place of choice, brings you back to this place of empowerment where your emotions are not running the show. And so as you sit at that table, now you get to choose who sits at that table with you. And, you know, I've had, you know, people say to me, well, I've had a falling out with a friend and we process the emotions around that friend breakup. But then people are terrified that they have to be that person's friend again. You know, the friend who hurt them so badly. No, that's your choice. If you want to be their friend, you can put parameters in place. And yes, you can revisit that friendship. But also by healing the pain, You can also release the friendship entirely. And that's another thing I've learned is I've come to really embrace reason, season, lifetime, right? People come into our life to teach us something. They may be here for a few years and leave, or they may be one of those few people that are there for a lifetime. But now when that happens, I just embrace it. If I have to do the grief recovery process to grieve the loss, the relationship, I will But it's so easy for me now to step into this place of gratitude. Thank you for the lesson. Thank you for the season. And then bless them and send them on their way. 
Amazing. That's so beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode today. I hope our listeners got a lot of value from this. You shared some incredible nuggets. If people are looking to get in contact with you, where can they find you? So they can find me on my website, which is intuitiveunderstanding.com. Um, there's a short form, but I'll I'll use that one for right now. Um, and what I want to tell people is it's not a sales website at all. It's full of free resources. So they certainly can get a hold of me that way. They also can reach me um, from my email at tdadams at rogers.com. I offer free discovery calls. And what's so very important about that is, you know, is the program a fit for you? Am I a fit for you? Mm -hmm. You know, as you both know, coaching only works if that connection is felt. So um, I love to spend the time to invest in that discovery call. And if we're fit, if the program's a fit, absolutely. If not, then again, I have a roster of people in my back pocket that, well, maybe you should talk to this person. Maybe they're a better fit than we are. So. It's not about, you know, you have to work with me. It's about, okay, where can I find the help that I need to be able to step fully into human being <laughs> in a positive way? Perfect. Thank you so much. Really appreciate having you on today. It's been wonderful chatting with you and kind of catching up because it's been a, a little while <laughs> since we've connected. So we look forward to sharing out all your information with everybody. And we really appreciate you being on the show again. And we'll catch everyone on the next episode.